Welcome, brothers and sisters in Christ, to the KGBC online worship service. I am so glad you're with us today as we continue into the second week of Ken's sermon series, Walk in Love. Today, Ken will unpack love defined in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and verse 13. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Hey everyone, in Psalm 65 a it says, the whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. I'm so incredibly thankful that today another opportunity has dawned and we have the joy to worship our Savior right now. He is calling each one of us to enter into worship with Him. So let us leave behind the baggage, the worry and stress, and just enter into His presence today. Love you, church family, so much. We as a church support many missions organizations all throughout the year, but there are several missions that we consider to be our missions partners. One of those partnerships is with our very own Julia Wallace, who is serving in Lebanon through the Lebanese Society for Educational and Social Development, otherwise known as the LSESD. Julia will be there for at least two years, and we as a church are supporting her with $300 a month, helping to provide her housing, food, insurance, and more, so she can serve refugees and the people of Lebanon. How are you doing that? You're doing that through your general giving. A portion of your tithe goes to support missions like Julia's each and every time you give. So thank you. Julia recently reached out wanting to give the church an update as well as some prayer requests. So check out this interview that we did earlier this week. Hey, Julia. Hey, Beth. Hey, King's Grant family. It's so good to be here with you all. It's so good to see you. You know, this past week you reached out with an email uh, just letting us know about um, some prayer requests and some things that are happening in Lebanon. So I just thought it'd be a great idea for you to fill in our church family um, and let us know how we can be supporting and praying for you guys right now. Yeah, no, thank you so much for uh, for giving me this space to let you know what's happening. So um, things in Lebanon have been a little crazy the past, past few weeks, past month really. So this is actually the fourth week we are in a total lockdown. Uh, so that's 24 hours, seven day a week curfew. Um, businesses are closed. You need government exemptions to go out. It's the most uh, strict restrictions they've had since COVID hit Lebanon last February. Um, and uh, one of the reasons, unfortunately, that we have to do this is that um, COVID is also at an all-time high. So as many COVID deaths have occurred in January as all of last year, uh, the first week of February, we actually passed the U.S. as the number one country in the world for death rates um, at one point. And so so things are crazy with that. Uh, hospitals are past capacity. We're out of beds not enough ventilators, oxygen, things like that. So it is a very tumultuous situation. Um, Unfortunately though, it's also a catch 22. So if the country stays open, people die of COVID. If the country closes, people die um, of starvation because a lot of people do uh, work cash in hand jobs. And so businesses and families have been really, really impacted the past month, especially. Um, So we, yes, please keep Lebanon in your prayers. This is also all happening in the worst economic crisis Lebanon has ever had and exacerbating that. So um, a U.S. report recently said that about 55% of the Lebanese population is in the poverty, under the poverty line, um, and 28% are extreme poverty. Uh, And this is two to three times last year's average. Um, So just please uh, keep Lebanon in your prayers because there's a lot going on right now. Wow, absolutely heartbreaking. Um, We are just so thankful for organizations like the LSESD uh, and the ways that they are 
trying to minister during these times. And so what is your organization doing right now? How are they able to get out? What are some things that they're able to do uh, right now to, to minister to people? Yeah, so thankfully some of our uh, min ongoing ministries are still happening uh, because they're deemed necessary. For instance, the food aid programs. We do a lot to provide uh, supplemental food boxes as well as food vouchers for, for families. Um, specifically vulnerable families. So Lebanese families who are kind of in the lower socioeconomic status, but also for the uh, many refugees who are living in the country. Um, so those ongoing ministries are still happening. Uh, in addition to food boxes, they're also distributing hygiene kits that include sanitation and masks, uh, necessary things during COVID. Um, but then in addition to those regular ministries, uh, we've also started doing a few smaller projects like um, uh, providing warm home cooked meals for for, for people who have COVID. So uh, every two days, our ministry sends out uh, cooked meals to different families that they've identified who have family members who have COVID. Um, so that's, those are some of the main things. Uh, in the office, a lot of us are still working on grant proposals and reports to try and um, you know procure funds to keep these ministries going. Wow, so much that we can be praying for during this time. So let us know, what are some ways that we can specifically pray for Lebanon, uh, how we can pray for your organization, but also what are some ways that we can pray for you uh, during this time? Because we, we, we are supporting you financially, but we want to also support you with prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, for Lebanon, the biggest prayer right now is that COVID's, COVID gets contained. Uh, so that's the, the biggest thing. Um, and, and with that, prayers for the medical personnel who are on the front lines fighting this thing and, and caring for people. Uh, we'd also love prayers for the economy. Um, again, a lot of people are really uh, in dire situations, very stretched thin. So just prayers for provision and relief, um, which means also prayers for the organizations who are stepping in. Again, there's no public assistance really in this country. It's all uh, relies on private institutions and nonprofits to keep people afloat. Uh, so please just pray for, for their resilience and endurance as they um, continue the good, the work before them, uh, despite their own fatigue um, and exhaustion. So just prayers for that as well. Um, as far as personal prayers, uh, just for safety for myself and my colleagues, um, since COVID is still uh, ramped up uh, pretty high. Um, Arabic. I'm also learning Arabic and would love prayer as I learned this beautiful but difficult new language. Um, and then finally, Beth knows this and I think many of you do too, but uh, I got engaged back in December. And so I would love prayers for me and my fiance, Michael, as we prepare for uh, life together and uh, preparing for wedding stuff later this year. So that uh, is a big and good prayer request. Well, congratulations. We're so excited for you and your engagement. Uh, that's so exciting. Uh, but we also want to pray for you today. We want to pray for um, for you and for the ministry and for Lebanon. So uh, thank you for giving us this update and letting us know how we can be supportive. So why don't we all pray together? God, we thank you for this time with Julia. God, we thank you um, for this update on what's going on. And God, our hearts are broken. Our hearts are overwhelmed uh, by the needs that are going on uh, all around the world. Uh, but God, we specifically want to focus this morning on Lebanon and our hearts are just burdened uh, for for the things that are going on. And God, we do. We pray that uh, COVID would be contained. Father, that um, God, that you would, uh, the numbers would, would go down, that people would be well. Uh, God, that uh, the, the country would open back up so that people can get the things that they need and do the things they need to do and work the jobs they need to work. Uh, God, we pray for medical personnel who are on the front lines who are who are working so hard and so tirelessly uh, to, to help and treat people. God, we pray for protection over them as well. And God, for these families and for these individuals who are suffering right now, who are, um, who are starving, who are in need of work and who, who are in need of uh, things for their families. God, we just pray for provision. We pray for relief for them. God, we pray that you would provide uh, the, the basic necessities that they need. And God, we, uh, we thank you for ministries like the LSESD and others who are working so hard to meet the needs of others who are uh, working to um, 
to bring meals in, to uh, get people the health care they need. Um, but also, God, those who are just trying to give the best help they can give and to tell others about you. Father, we we pray that even though the country is shut down, that the, the gospel will not be. God, that the gospel will still continue to go out to these to these people, to these families, and God, that your truth will be heard. Father, we pray for leadership. We pray for wise leaders who would step in and, and meet the needs of others, who would um, recognize the great challenge before them, but God, lead uh, with kindness and love and uh, with wisdom. And so, God, we pray that that would happen in Lebanon. And God, we thank you uh, for for Julia. We thank you for our partnership with her over these next couple of years. God, we pray that you would keep her safe uh, from COVID and just uh, the rest of her team, God, that you would keep them all safe right now. God, we pray that you would be with her. She's trying to learn Arabic. God, that you would help her to recall uh, the language and, and, and the words that she's supposed to, to know so that she can communicate well with others. And Father, finally, we thank you so much for uh, Julia's engagement. We're so excited for, for her and for Michael and their upcoming marriage. We pray that this time would be a blessing, uh, God, and that you would just be with them as they're trying to make future plans and just, just bless uh, their upcoming marriage. God, we love you so much, and we're so thankful that you keep us connected, even though we're really far apart. Thank you for allowing us to be involved in kingdom work. Um, God, thank you for partnering us uh, with one another so that um, the reach can be farther. God, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for your your goodness and your grace and your mercy uh, each and every day. And God, uh, I thank you for our church who is so generous and so loving and giving. And I pray, um, God, that we would continue to recognize needs all around the world and to be your hands and feet. God, thank you so much for this time with Julia. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And thank you, King's Grant family. I just want to say thank you so much for your uh, continual prayers and support. Uh, I'm here because you enabled me to be here. So thank you. And please know that uh, the work here in Lebanon, we're directly connected with. Um, I know this organization is thankful to have free labor for a couple of years. So thank you for making that possible and for your continued prayers. Uh, I hope you know that I think about you and pray for you all uh, with deep, deep affection. And I love you all so much.
my burden says None but me Dear Lord None but me Silence at your command. When my broken heart was healed in the palm of your hand, you smile. Down your arms and you broke my fall on that day when your love took my place on the cross. You swore.
1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. And now we have these three things, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Once again, I'd like to share with you some definitions of love from the perspective of children. One child writes concerning what is love. When my grandmother, who got arthritis, can't bend her knees, and Grandpa paints her toenails for her. Yes, I would call that love. Another child writes, when someone loves you, the way they say your name is different, and you know your name is safe in their mouth. Wow, isn't that something? Love does not degrade others. Love cherishes the name and the person. Great definitions of love. Some other children made these comments. Uh, Love is when uh, mommy makes daddy coffee and takes a sip before giving it to him to make certain it tastes okay. I can identify with that. Love is what's in the room when at Christmas time, after you've opened all the presents, you sit and listen. That's a good definition of love. Now, I love this one. Love is the little old woman and the little old man who are still friends even after all of these years of knowing each other so well. Another child writes, Love is when mommy sees daddy sweaty and smelly and still says he's handsomer than Brad Pitt. Okay, there you go. And here's another one. Love is when your puppy licks your face after you have left him alone all day. I'd say that's a good definition of love. And here's the final one. You really shouldn't say I love you, one child writes, unless you mean it. But if you mean it, say it a lot. People forget I love these expressions because through the child's mind, we're allowed to see the definition of love in the details of real life. Now, the Bible tells us how love should be demonstrated, and the Bible also tells us how love should be defined. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible told us that love should be demonstrated in these facts, we, we should imitate God as dearly loved children, and then we should walk in love. Love is demonstrated when we imitate God's love for us. That's the standard of love. Love is demonstrated when we love others as we ourselves are dearly loved children of God. And so we love from within the relationship we have with God. We all have the capacity to love. This is also how love is demonstrated. Uh, Love is also demonstrated as we walk in love because love represents or at least should represent a lifestyle. Now, looking deeply within the lifestyle to the details of life, we move from how love is demonstrated to how love is defined. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it is as if the Bible peers down into the micro details of our lives to guide us in understanding how love becomes a lifestyle in in the details of how we live from, from day to day. Now, I love this chapter because obviously it's known as the love chapter, but this content, 1 Corinthians 13, 
represents more than simply good content for a wedding. Now, I've done hundreds and hundreds of weddings, and most of those weddings have the reading of 1 Corinthians 13. And so it certainly represents a great focus for weddings and for marriages. But the storyline behind 1 Corinthians 13 represents the actual accountability that followers of Jesus have to love in every detail of life, especially down to the basic foundation of who we are as people who have faith in Christ. Let me prove this to you. If you were to look inside of 1 Corinthians from chapter 11 to 14, you would see what I like to call the macro story. The Apostle Paul is writing into a, a congregation that had some incredible challenges morally, and, and their, their depraved morality actually began to affect their lives in public. In fact, public worship became a very distracted and, and disoriented experience where the focus was was no longer on Jesus, but on one another. And so Paul writes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to 14, how to refocus public worship on the love of God through Jesus Christ. Narrowing a little more, to, more from the macro story to the, to the micro story, we now look at chapter 12, where Paul, Paul focuses on the spiritual gifts. Because within this problem of public worship, there were individuals who were practicing their callings or their gifts for self-notice and self-importance. Now, peering even more specifically into the micro story of, of these verses, Paul addressed two gifts that were being abused, two practices of spiritual gifts. One would be the speaking in tongues and the other would be prophecy. These gifts were being practiced in a way that drew attention to individuals and had no purpose of honoring and glorifying Jesus. And so Paul even moves more specifically into the micro part of this story by taking the emphasis off of what we do concerning the gifts and placing the emphasis on what matters most. So from the larger story all the way to this very pinpointed application, what is the one focus that Paul, led by God's Holy Spirit, encouraged the church to, to place their lives upon? That focus is indeed love. In fact, the very last phrase of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 announces, I will show you a better way. So public worship and, and church life and the practice of spiritual gifts and our callings, all is for nothing. If this one pinpointed ingredient, our focus becomes missing, and that one focus is indeed Love. So love becomes defined down in the, in the micro details of our existence as followers of Jesus. This becomes the story of 1 Corinthians 13, the meaning or the context behind these words. So now that we can see the frame that God's word gives us concerning the emphasis of how love should be defined, I'd like to take a few minutes with you to walk through these very familiar verses to better reacquaint ourselves with how love should be defined. We're in part two of our teaching series, Walk in Love, and to move from love demonstrated to love defined, we need to see some specifics that are listed here, and I believe these will help you and encourage you. So I'd like to share with you several answers to the question, how do we define love? How is love manifested in the, in the tiniest details in the most concentrated areas of our lives? Well, let me give you several answers. There are as many as 10, and let's see how far we may go in this. We're going to focus first on verses 1, 2, and 3 of 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak with eloquent languages of men or of angels and have love, I'm a noisy gong, a clinging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and I have knowledge and I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all of my goods to the poor or if I martyr myself by giving my body to be burned and have not love, I'm, I'm nothing. So verses 1, 2, and 3 give some uh, examples of what you and I might call exemplary acts of Christian faith. A strong faith that moves mountains, an eloquent and articulate way of, of reflecting the mysterious truths of God, 
benevolence toward the poor, even martyrdom with our own physical well-being, all of these that might represent exemplary Christian living becomes nothing without love. So I'm not sure where you are in this topic of love in the, in the basic and most foundational details of your life, but let's look at some of the definitions of love so that we do not uh, become nothing uh, concerning the standards of Scripture, even though we may think we're, we're accomplishing great things for our Lord. If love does not become the foundation, then all that we would do is for nothing. So let's, let's look at how love is defined. I'll give you several of these. Beginning with verse 4, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, love does not boast, and love is not proud. Number one, love is patient. Now, the word patient here can reflect this idea of suffering long with someone. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, we read, Bear up with one another and forgive one another as the Lord has forgiven you. It's interesting that the Bible reminds us that if we are to be patient or to bear with one another, the motivation becomes Jesus has forgiven us, and therefore we must be that patient and that merciful with others. If 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 I am to forbear with others, my motivation needs to be that, that I need people forbearing with me. I know that my life requires other people to be patient with me. And so this scripture calls us to be patient with others because Christ has, has been merciful and, and patient with us, long-suffering with us, bringing us forgiveness. And, and what an incredible calling we have first to see that our love for others should be a love that is patient. When I look at the very definition of this idea of patience in the, in the New Testament language, the message comes staying with. Patience indicates staying with and not growing weary of love that we have for others. So I encourage you in your love, stay with it. Be patient, be forbearing, be long-suffering uh, with others. Psalm 136 verse 1 reminds us that that God's loving kindness lasts forever. And so God's covenant love is an enduring love. But his covenant love also represents this kindness. So look at the second definition of love. Love is not only patient, love is kind. This is an elementary trait, a rudimentary trait, because from the youngest age to the oldest, we are all expected to be kind. This idea of kindness comes from the, the idea of of not ignoring or disrespecting what is commonly expected. Oh, how we must, we must be very open and expressive in our, in our faith and our love for Christ. The idea of kindness represents practical acts of goodness that should be expected of people who are following Jesus. So love is indeed kind. Third definition, love does not envy. Now, the, the message of envy also resonates the message of jealousy. Love does not exhibit jealousy. This word actually indicates being heated up or resentful. To be envious or jealous is to indicate that although we may say we love, our love eventually circumvents the person to whom we think we're loving and we look for our own benefit and our own um, our own way and agenda to be fulfilled. And so now that's not love. No, love is not jealous. Love is not bent toward envy or, or self-serving. Love is not resentful. So many times uh, love can, can dangerously transform to resentment if things just do not go our way with how another person treats us. Love does not envy. Love is not resentful. Look at a fourth definition. Love does not boast. I love this term boast. It comes from a word that, that can actually mean bellows. The word is in the Greek, physis or physius. And it, and it references the action of huge wind bellows that are used to thrust forth air, particularly in stirring up the heat of a fire. Love does not <laughs> billow itself. Love does not inflate itself. This is the meaning behind the definition love does not boast. Love does not inflate one's self-importance or self 
promotion at the expense of others. Love is always selfless, not bent toward benefiting self. Love does not puff up our own importance. Love is different than this. Love is, is not prideful. Love, love seeks and gives and, and becomes humble. So love does not boast. Here's a fifth definition. Love does not act rudely. Well, the New American Standard Bible defines this as unbecoming. Love does not act unbecoming or out of sorts. The idea of rudeness here represents going against what would be our common behavior. Now, as a Christian, our common activity, attitude, and behavior represents honoring Jesus. And so the idea of love that acts rudely is not a love that is simply obstinate or, or becomes expressive of bad manners. The idea of Love being rude is the idea of ignoring what should be commonly expected of a follower of Jesus. So the standard remains high. The character in the face of Christ in our love becomes our standard, becomes the common activity of our lives. And the idea of, of our love acting rudely would be that our love uh, falls well short of the standard of Jesus and what is common among Christians and Love then becomes self-seeking. So love does not act rudely. Love does not ignore what is expected of a, of a child of God. Sometimes we feel we maintain love with others, but we act in a way that, that indicates we, we, are, we are giving the other person what we think they deserve in our words or in our actions. And Scripture says, no, love does not act in any way that falls short of what Jesus would expect in our lives. Love does not, does not act rudely. And here's a sixth definition. Love does not seek itself. This comes straight from verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 13. Love does not behave rudely. The verse says, love does not seek its own. Love does not seek itself. Conversely, according to Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, love considers others more important than self. True love always presents a deep sense of otherness so that we value the other, even as Christ valued us. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, we read, love, love puts the importance of, of others first. And then following that verse, we're giving the greatest example of otherness. Have this attitude in yourselves. Philippians 2, 5 reminds us, uh, who Christ, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, took on the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of man, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, Christ himself gave. Christ himself laid himself down for us, for you and for me. And so love does not seek its own. Love is constantly looking at the other and saying, you are more valuable, more important than me. This is a tall order in a Western culture where we are, we are conditioned to seek our own comfort and to seek our own benefit. Love always values the other person over self. Love does not seek itself. The seventh definition of love. Love is not provoked to anger easily. And this is, again, straight from the scripture. Uh, straight from, from verse five. Uh, love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not easily provoked. Love is not provoked to anger easily. I remember a verse from Psalm 37, verse 8. Do not fret, it only leads to evil. But the term fret there represents a spirit that is vexed, heated up, perhaps even vengeful. And love does not become an expression that is easily provoked to a heated attitude or harmful words. Love is not easily angered. You and I have perhaps said or heard others say, wow, that person really pushed my buttons. The scripture says your buttons shouldn't be exposed. <laughs> you should not be easily provoked. Your buttons shouldn't be easily pushed. Love is not easily provoked to anger. Psalm 37, 8, again, do not fret. It only leads to evil. The word evil there means destruction. Our fretfulness, our being heated up can only can only produce 
destructive behaviors in our lives and in other relationships. Love is not easily angered. Love is not easily provoked. Think about this. The next time a a relationship, especially those close to you, uh, offers a circumstance where you feel you're getting vexed and heated, quote these words, claim this verse, love, true love does not become provoked, not easily conditioned to be anger. This is our seventh definition of love. Now let's move to number eight. The eighth way that this passage defines love is this. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Again, straight from verse five. Love keeps no record of wrong. Story is told of the, uh, the old man sitting with his, with his counselor and he said to the, to the counselor, my wife is acting historical. And the counselor said, don't you mean hysterical? He said, no, historical. She's constantly bringing up the past. Well, the scripture reminds us love doesn't do this. Love doesn't keep a record of wrong. I think you'll find this interesting. This phrase, record of wrong, comes from the Greek term logizomai, which actually can mean a rational summation. There is a sense of an accounting activity here. Love does not make a rational list of things done wrong and computes at the end, this person is bad and has done this against me and holds that in front of their eyes every time they see that person. Love doesn't keep records of wrong. Now, granted that that there are those when they bring harm against us, that harm must must go through healing. And sometimes we need help and counsel and, and we need others around us to help us in that healing. But But in the sense of you and I expressing love to others. Love doesn't hold up an account of offenses that have been made against us so that we look at that person through the offenses as if to say, hey, I might forgive, but never forget. No, love doesn't hold on to that record of wrong. Perhaps that wrong is there and and it will be there for a while in your mind if the hurt has been deep. But love doesn't use that as the accounting, as the logizomai, as the rationale to return hatred or to return a spirit of bitterness or resentment. Love doesn't hold up what is wrong and and continually replaying those wrongs in our minds. No, love love seeks to, to heal and to move toward forgiveness and releasing the other person from any harmful resentment or vengeance we would have against them. Love keeps no record of wrong. Now look at the ninth definition as we move toward the end of our list. Love does not delight in evil. Again, straight from the scripture, verse six now. Love doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love doesn't delight in evil. Love doesn't look for the evil in another person so that we might build a case against that person. This becomes the definition. There are those who build cases for themselves. I understand that may be what we're thinking, but a follower of Jesus doesn't intentionally look for what is wrong and then celebrates that wrong in a way to uh, diminish or, or to create derision or to tear down another's character. Love does not delight in evil. And then finally, number 10, love rejoices in the truth. This is love. I know these are many definitions, but verse 10 seems to reach back and, and gently but firmly uh, hold all of these truths and and say, this is love. All of these truths that have come to us become a summation in verse 10. This is what love rejoices in, the truth that God has revealed to us concerning love. Now, Romans chapter 12, verse 9, a verse we'll actually look at next week, reminds us that we should love sincerely. Let your love be sincere. The word sincere indicates without impurities. Uh, Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Allow your love to cling to the truth of God. See that which God desires to do in the other person as, as a door through which you love that person. This is an amazing opening of our eyes and hearts to the other. God may be at work there. Love that person. Even when they may seem too difficult to love, love them. Love what is right. God may be working in their lives, so seek the opportunity to show love and to encourage what God may be doing within their hearts. A love rejoices in the truth. So now we come to verse 7. And verse 7 gives us this incredible summary that I love. And we read this from verse seven. Love protects all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures 
all things. Now notice these four statements of love that I believe represent a good summary of all that has been written here concerning the practical application of love down in the details of our lives. Love protects. That's what the meaning of bear indicates. As love bears all things, the deeper meaning is love protects. Love doesn't betray. Love doesn't go behind the back. Love protects the relationship. Be careful of this. Young and old, make certain that your love, Christian love, that exhibits the face of Christ, make sure that your love does does a pure representation of Christ and, and that it protects and doesn't betray. Love believes all things. The, the, the meaning is that love, love trusts. Love never gives up. Oh, I've heard so many times people saying, I just can't, just can't love that person anymore. I just can't be around that person. Well, then, then Christian love has ceased to exist in your words, hopefully not in your heart, because love does not cease to believe that God can do something great in that relationship. Again, where there has been hurt that needs support and counsel, that needs to be solved through communities of faith. But, but oh, if, if, if you have the opportunity to demonstrate the love of Christ, one of the greatest opportunities is, is loving uh, even when you feel like uh, that, that all has been lost in that relationship. A third, uh, love hopes all things. Uh, love, true love, holds on to what is secure. And God blessing our effort to love others is the security. Uh, love does not act insecure. Love does not withhold, but love gives. And love is confident. It, it hopes all things. And then finally, love endures all things. It perseveres. It stands firm in the midst of trials. Why are these four summary type expressions so important to all that we've looked above? Because these four lead to the ultimate conclusion. Love never fails. Loving as Christ loves us will never fail. The scripture has unfolded a lot of definitions before at this moment, but, but I encourage you, go back to these verses. Make note of those definitions that you felt were vacant or have been vacant from how you've been living out your love for others and return to this love that scripture prescribes because this love never fails. This indicates that as we love with these commitments, God will bless and bring fruit from the love. You may, you may have loved someone for years and, and cease yet to, to see love, but, but this does not indicate that God is not bringing your love to fruition. There will be fruit from your love as you love in this way, God will do amazing works and he'll, he'll bring amazing accomplishments if we continue to love in this way. There's a story of a hiker. Her name is Catherine Grohn. She was hiking the Pacific Rim. You know this trail of the West Coast, uh, about 2,600 miles. And she was hiking uh, from the southern part to the most northern part. She only had 150 miles left. She was in Washington State. The weather was growing inclement, and she came across a day hiker, Nancy Abel. Well, Abel looked at this weary hiker and discouraged her from finishing the trail because uh, Abel had heard the weather reports are bad, the, the, the terrain is treacherous, you have no uh, snowshoes, you can't, you can't finish out. But uh, Gron uh, disregarded her warning and, and wanted to complete the trail. Well, this stranger, Nancy Abel, as she returned to her car, she grew concerned for this one who was traveling. And so she called the local county sheriff, the, the, the sheriff's department of Snohomish, this county near the uh, base of the trail. And she called and reported that a hiker could, could be in potential danger. The, the sheriff's office gave attention to that warning. They eventually found Grown. And when they found Grown, Catherine Grown, she was she was just hours away from death. The hypothermia had set in. She, she was ill-equipped to finish the trail. She had, she had fallen into some treacherous terrain. Her cell phone was out of range. And she was at the point of death when she was discovered. But she was brought back to safety, survived. And in an interview several weeks later, this was her comment. The reason I took this hike is because I have lost all faith in humanity. Everything that's going on has made me lose hope in any good that comes from humanity. But she said, thanks to this stranger who decided to love me, even though she didn't know me, by sending help, she has brought back my faith in relationships in a really big way. Now, I share that story with you 
just for the very simple and obvious application. There may be people in your path who've just given up on relationships. In fact, I know they are. And they are seeking someone to prove to them the love of Christ. And let's do this, dear people of God. Let's love, as the scripture indicates, as God himself has prescribed. Let's define love in, in the intricate details of our lives. And let's go forward loving as Jesus loved us. That is indeed love defined. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for teaching us through your word. Help us to love as you love. Thank you for these intricate, specific, <laughs> micro details of how love should be very real in the, in the deepest parts of our lives. And Father, help us to follow your word and to trust you as you lead us to love others well. Help us to walk in love in the way that you have loved us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And together we said, amen. At this moment, there's a, a website location on the screen. Maybe somewhere in the course of this worship time online, God has spoken to your heart. And maybe you realize that there's some relationships and some decisions and, and some uh, directions in your life that really are leading to destruction. And you need to, need to speak to someone. Reach out to this website location. We'll be uh, prompt to return uh, our, our contact right back to you. Or perhaps today you've heard of the love of Christ over and over again and you realize your life has never been surrendered completely to Jesus. And you're saying today is the day I give my life completed to Jesus and place my faith in him. And your scripture says, if we trust him and confess him as Lord and, and confess our sins to him and receive his forgiveness, uh, we will be saved and changed forever. And so I pray that your heart is open to Jesus. Reach out to us. We want to talk to you more about what it means to know Jesus personally. Thank you for being a part of the, this second session of our teaching series, Walk in Love. I look forward to next week. We'll be in Romans chapter 12 as we discover how love is determined. And I hope you'll join us for that. Love you a lot. We'll see you soon.